All right, everybody, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to continue on in our series through Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And as you're turning there, please allow me to pray for our time together. Father God, there are people in these pews today hurting. There are people in these pews today who are confused and perplexed at the work of your hands. There are people here today, likely, Lord, that do not know your Son, whom you sent to be the propitiation of our sins. And so, Lord, what they need is Jesus. They they don't need me. And so I ask that you would be present in this preaching moment and that you would drive the truth of your Son, Jesus, into their heart of hearts so that they may see the gospel more clearly, so they might see you more clearly, that they might love you more deeply, and they might be sanctified more fully. It is your word that does the cutting, Lord, and we ask that you would do such a work today for your people, that you would illuminate the text, and that you would show forth your beauties and your glories to your people. And we ask this, not on our merit, and not because we deserve it, but because of Jesus' meritorious work on our behalf. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. It has often been said that the most important thing about you is what you think about God. The way in which you entertain ideas of who God is really tells who in fact you are, and how you see yourself in light of who God is. In fact, John Calvin, when he wrote his Institutes, said that it was somewhat arbitrary that he started with the doctrine of God, because in order to know God, you must know yourself, and in order to know yourself, you must know God. They are absolutely and utterly linked. In order to see God's holiness, we must see our sinfulness. And in order to see our sinfulness, we most certainly need to see God's holiness. And this is true of the topic that we are speaking about today, because divine sovereignty, which is what is going to be discussed today, because that is a part of who God is, not just what He does, how we view God's sovereignty has everything to do with how we answer the question, How do you think about God? And not only that, but it helps you understand and me understand how we relate to such a big God. Is God sovereign? Now, when I say the word sovereign, I mean, is God in complete control? Is God orchestrating all things that come to pass? And I do mean absolutely everything. Friends, the reality is that God is so in control of absolutely everything that there is no, as R.C. Sproul has said, maverick molecule in the universe. That everything that happens, happens because God is completely, and as I have said, utterly sovereign. In other words, God creates salvation, He creates joy, He creates happiness. But guys, hear me on this. It is also God who creates disasters, disease, disability, and death. There is nothing that escapes our God's gaze. His hand is actively at work in absolutely everything. And we need to understand that. And we need to understand that according to the Bible... Because understanding sovereignly rightly enables us to praise God rightly. Because if we don't understand what it means that God is absolutely and utterly sovereign, then we can't praise Him as we ought because we're worshiping a God that is not the God of the Bible. Secondarily, we need to understand that God is sovereign because God being sovereign is our boast in salvation. It removes self from the whole equation. It is our only hope for prayer. If God is not sovereign, then we need not waste our time praying to Him. 
It is the reason that we engage in evangelism. It is the reason that we have success in evangelism. And friends, hear me on this as well. And I think it's very pertinent to our specific family at this time that it actually gives meaning to suffering. If God is not, suf- is, is not sovereign, then suffering is absolutely and utterly meaningless and chaotic. But because God is sovereign, He wields and He moves on behalf of His people in and through suffering, and He uses it to bring about good, which is the only thing that God can in fact do. And so the doctrine that we are going to extract from today's text, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, is this. God has according to the counsel of his own will, sovereignly orchestrated all things that come to pass for the praise of his glory and the saints' good. In other words, the doctrine that we are going to extract today is that God, according to his own initiative, according to his desire and good pleasure, has caused everything that has happened to happen the way that it has happened and will happen. And as we look at the text, we're going to look at these realities, that God is sovereign, first and foremostly, in Christ. That God is sovereign over your salvation. That God is sovereign over all things. And God's sovereignty produces God worshipers. And so, if you would, please stand with me for the honoring and reading of God's holy, infallible, and all-sufficient word. And as is custom, we are going to read verses 3 through 14 so we can be caught up in Paul's argumentation in this long, one long run on sentence in the Greek. It says this Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love by predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graciously bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound to us all in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him. For an administration of the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, the things in heavens and the things on the earth in him. In him we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will to the end that we, who were first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance unto the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. Uh, Will you have a seat with me? Now, since it's been a little while since we've been in the book of Ephesians, we took a small break for our Good Friday services and our Easter Sunday. I want to remind you uh, where we've been. Paul has been writing a letter to the churches in Ephesus. And what he is doing is he is helping them combat some issues that they have in their church. And he's doing that not by rebuking them, not by chastising them, not by calling them to account, but reminding them first, for, first and foremostly who they are in Christ Jesus. That they have been gifted with every single spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That there is nothing that God the Father has withheld from his people. And part of that means that they have been chosen before the foundation of the world, that God elected them to salvation. 
that he went after them. When they were running away, he stepped in and dragged them to himself. And he did this not just so we could get out of hell free, not just so that they, who he was speaking to, could get out of hell free, but so that they would do something. Namely, that they would stand holy and blameless before him in love. That they would be justified. That they would be seen right in the sight of God. And that they would be sanctified. That is, that they would be progressively made sinless over time. But if that wasn't beautiful enough, he goes on to say then that not only have we been justified in the courtroom, according to God's counsel, but we have been brought into the family room and we are now adopted as sons and daughters of the God Most High. And he did this because he delighted to do so. Not because of any merit in us, but because of the merit of that is in Christ Jesus, because it says in verse 7 that he also gave redemption to his people. That is, he pulled them back from the bonds and chains of slavery and gave them new life, covered their sin, and then changed their hearts, causing them to be regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. They had hearts of stone, we had hearts of stone, and in Christ we have been given hearts of flesh. This is the promise of the new covenant. And he does this once again according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. It's all about Christ Jesus. And then we talked about how all of that is just kind of the the, the, the miniature display of the global reality that will happen in the eschaton. That is, that Jesus, according to verses 9 and 10, is summing up all things in himself. Every single thing that is in rebellion against God and rejects Jesus Christ will one day bow their knee to this King Jesus, whether they want to or not. And today we move somewhat from the 30,000 foot view of what God has done in an eternity past to the real life of the believer. And so if you remember, we talked about the reality that Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14 is a proclamation, a doxology, a worshipful declaration of what God has done in his triunity. That verses 1 through 6 are all about what God has done in eternity past. Verses 7 through 12 are all about what the Son has done to accomplish and purchase redemption for His people. And verses 13 and 14 are all about how the Spirit thus applies it. And so today we're kind of wrapping up the section that has to do with God the Son, Jesus Christ. But in such a way that helps us to understand the role in which, or maybe the role is the wrong way, but, but the application by which that redemption is applied to the believer and what that actually looks like. And so if you will, look with me here, firstly at chapter 1, verse 11. Paul starts off here saying, In him we also have been made an inheritance. Our first point that we are going to look at today is that God is sovereign in Christ Now, one of the things I love about the Legacy Standard Bible is that it is literal, almost to the point of being overly redundant. In verse 11, it says, in him. But in verse 10, it ends by saying, in him. Look with me here. It says that he is Christ, summing up all things, things in heavens and things on the earth in him. And most translations leave it at that, or they leave it out, and then they start in him in the next verse. But in the Legacy Standard Bible, they say in him, period, and then they start in him again. And the truth that Paul wants you to understand, if it isn't clear already, as we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, is that everything is about him. Everything is about Jesus. And the fact that you, Christian, get any sort of spiritual blessing, any sort of redemption, any sort of anything, is because Jesus Christ has won it all, has paid it all, has purchased it all, and he has done so for the joy that was set before him, Hebrews chapter 12 says. It is in him, 
that God is exercising his sovereignty toward you. Now, we're going to get into it. God is sovereign over everything. God is sovereign over absolutely everything. Everything. Both for the believer and the unbeliever. But there's a special, affectionate type of sovereignty that is aimed at those whom he has predestined and chose to save and love on. As a matter of fact, when we get into the end of chapter 1, it's going to blow your mind that Paul makes the argument that Jesus Christ has been given his kingship over the cosmos for the sake of the church. Jesus is the agent by which God shows sovereign, electing, redeeming love to his people. It's all about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And we know this because in this doxology, verses 3 through 14, the modifying phrase in Christ or in him is used 36 times in the books of, book of Ephesians. And it's used 11 times just in these first 14 verses. If we don't understand that everything is in Christ, then we've missed the point of Ephesians. Children, would you look at me? Children, did you know that your salvation and the Bible and creation and absolutely everything, the food that you eat, the parents that you have that love you and care for you, and even the things that are bad that happen sometimes, that's all about Jesus. Jesus is everything. That's mind-blowing. But it's true. It's beautifully and wonderfully true. But what is God sovereignly in Christ doing according to these verses? Well, secondarily, we want to look at this reality, that God is sovereign over your salvation. Verse 11, again, it says, In him we also have been made an inheritance. So when I say that God is sovereign over your salvation, what I mean is this. That without God's divine sovereignty, the sovereignty that he exercises toward his people in Christ, if we don't have that, then we need to understand that our Christian future would be insecure. We would have no reason to hope. (laughs) And it says here that we have been made an inheritance. Now, Here's what I know. I know that most of you are probably holding a translation that does not translate the verse that I just said this way. Most of your translations will say something to the effect of, we have obtained an inheritance. So it would read, according to your translation in him, we also have obtained an inheritance. But as you have noticed, if you're using one of our pew Bibles or you use the Legacy Standard Bible or you're hearing me preach right now, you see that it says, in him, we also have been made an inheritance. And those are two different ideas. (laughs) And so the question becomes, well, what is it actually saying? Well, there's a Greek word here that is somewhat debated, and it's kind of rooted in the idea of to have a lot or to be allotted something or given something. And the question becomes, well, who gets that allotment? Who gets that lot? Who gets that inheritance? Or as the King James says, that heritage. Well, some people take it to mean that we obtain the inheritance and other people who translate and who are smarter than me see it the other way, that God is the one who receives the inheritance in Christ. And I want to make the argument today that I think the Legacy Standard Bible is correct, but that doesn't make the other translation untrue. As a matter of fact, throughout the Bible, it is absolutely clear that we as Christians in Christ will receive an inheritance. All those in Christ have a present possession, that is, they have been justified, they have been saved, and they also have a future hope. As we talked about 
as far as the blessings are concerned, that it comes to us by virtue of the fact that we are adopted into God's family. And adopted children get an inheritance. That we are, according to Romans 8.17, joint heirs with Christ. This is why we call Christ our elder brother. This is replete in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says that to those who have been adopted, who are joint heirs with Christ, who have a future hope, have God as their God and have has his dwelling as their dwelling, which is the church. So you see, it is true that we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. As a matter of fact, if you look down, once we start talking about the Spirit in verse 13 and 14, 14 says that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a pledge of our inheritance. So by rendering it the way that the Legacy Standard Bible renders it, we do not lose the theology that we have been, in fact, given in Christ a future inheritance that will come to us in glory. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4 says this, a doxology much like Paul is engaged in here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you. What a mind-blowing passage. That because of Jesus' resurrection, by the way, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, amen? Because of his resurrection from the dead, we get the promised inheritance that was promised to the perfect Christ throughout all of redemptive history that is incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, and it is being kept in heaven, guarded by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing you did to earn it, and there is nothing you can do to be rid of it. Well, we have a rich inheritance because of Christ. But that's not what this text is teaching. This text is teaching that, and I want to both prove to you I've already said how it's translated, but also in context. In context, we're not talking about us. Have you noticed that? Not one time since Paul has started has he been talking about us by virtue of the fact of what we have done and what we receive just because. It's all about what God does and how he extends blessings and what God gets is what we're talking about now. We've talked about what God does and did in the person of uh, Jesus Christ, but now we're talking about what he gets because it's all about God. <laughs> Salvation from beginning to end is all about God. He is the one who gets the inheritance. He's the one who gets the heritage. He's the one who gets it all because he paid for it by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? When it says here that we have been made an inheritance, what it's saying is God has so worked in our lives that we now become Christ's possession and we become God's trophy, his treasure and his delight. Very simply, what I mean by that is that we are God's living picture of how great he absolutely is, and we are his. This is absolutely replete throughout all of the scriptures. In the Old Testament, God's people Israel were called the inheritance or the heritage and possession. Deuteronomy 9.20 says, O Lord Yahweh, do not destroy your people, even your inheritance whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a strong hand. In the same way, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20, he says, But Yahweh has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own inheritance. Friends, God's people are his inheritance. He receives 
a people to love forever because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And how does that work and why? Romans chapter 8 makes clear that the reason that God has such an affection for those whom he has saved is, one, because he just does. In the Old Testament, it was asked of God, or God said rather, I loved you because I love you, Israel. God loves because he loves. We can't understand that. First John chapter 4 states that we don't know what love is, that he had to show us what love is by sending his son to the cross to be slaughtered on our behalf. But Romans chapter 8 shows us that he has ensured with much patience vessels of mercy. I'll say that again in case you missed it because I fumbled over my tongue. He has ensured with much patience vessels of mercy. God has sovereignly worked out every single detail in your Christian life to bring you to the point that you are at now. The fact that you are a Christian, do you think that's an accident? No. The fact that you are sitting in these seats right here at Heritage Church, do you think that's an accident? No. Do you think any sort of thing that has happened on your path to obedience is an accident? No. God is the master weaver. And he has orchestrated salvific history in such a way to bring you to the place that you are currently at. And he's not going to stop until you see him in glory where you can dwell in his house forever and worship him forevermore. Every Christian, in other words, is a sovereignly molded miracle. And we've talked about this. You had to be predestined because your heart was so wicked. You had to have a heart change because it was going to not respond to spiritual stimuli. That we were, in fact, dead in our sin, and we needed to be revived by the defibrillator of grace. And so, God has done what he has done in your life to put you forth as a God-designed, God-crafted, God-actuated trophy to display his grace. He has taken a broken, sinful human who hated him in all of his pursuits and has made him and her God-loving, God-cherishing, Christ-promoting people. You guys are far too flippant about this. This is an amazing reality. He did what no one could do on their own. We talked about this on Good Friday. He walked the path. That is Jesus to be hated, to be spit on, to be broken, to be whipped with chains, and to be hung on a cross so that he could extend to you his perfect record and so that he could make you objects of his affection and show you off for eternity so that he could flex his sovereignty. It says here in verse 11, In him also we have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things. Now we're going to get into what it means to works all things, but I want you to see here first, firstly that he says that he works. According to the purpose of him, according to God's purpose, he works. So everything I just said is true, but even more than that, it means that God is not indifferent towards humanity. He is not aloof. He is not waiting on us to make some sort of move. He is not lazy or he is not unloving. He is intimately involved in every single thing that you go through, Christian. And what does that mean for the non-Christian? So here's the promise that God's sovereignty brings to the believer. That good things will always come from your bad things. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, For those who love God, God causes all things to work for the good of those who love Him. And what does that mean? That means that there is nothing in your life, no matter how tragic it is, that God is not going to undo in some sort of redemptive way to show forth his beauty and his glory. It may not happen here. It might happen when you see him in eternity. But when you look back and you see it, you will say, in your sovereignty, you made in your most wise counsel the right decision that would bring me into more satisfaction with who you are and what you have done. 
But here's what it means for the non-Christian. Bad stuff just happens to you. And then you die, and then bad stuff continues to happen to you for the rest of eternity. Oh, that you would see Christ today. That you would love Christ today. That you would repent of your sin today and see that God has not had you here by accident if you have not bowed your knee to Him. God, right now, through His person of the Holy Spirit, by the purchasing work of Christ, could be wooing and winning your heart to Him in this moment because that's what He does. So that he can show forth his glory. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we, that is Christians, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So not only is your salvation sovereignly orchestrated by the God of this universe, but every good work that you do is predetermined by God. Now, some of the objector, objectors here are going to say, well, if God is sovereign in here, there's no maverick molecule, and he predetermines everything that we do, well, then that means that we're not morally responsible, and God makes God some sort of moral monster. Well, let me say this. Your problem is not, well, your problem is with God, but your problem is not a misunderstanding of this reality. It's your philosophical system that's broken. <laughs> You don't come to the text with philosophy. You don't come to the text with preconceived notions of what autonomy looks like and how that functions. If God states that there is no problem with both him being sovereign and you being responsible, then you have to bump up against that wall and say, I don't fully understand how that works, but I must see it as a true reality. So if you have a problem with the fact that God is both sovereign and you are both responsible to repent of your sin and to believe him and love him, knowing that that belief and that repentance came from him, guess what we all do? But we see it, we love it, we want to appreciate it, and we work hard to dig deeper because it's true. It's true. We are his workmanship. And he is the author and perfecter of our faith. And you have good works to perform that he planted in your heart to do. He is sovereign over salvation. We can see this very clearly in Apostle Paul's life. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote this letter to the Ephesians, was consumed by God's sovereignty. Every letter that he writes is filled with the glories and beauties of the sovereignty of God because he felt it, he saw it, and he loved it. He was a man who studied more than anyone and persecuted the church of Christ until one day Christ, without asking his permission, without asking him to pray a prayer, without letting him come to some sort of decision on his own, kicked him off a horse and made him go blind and said, now you work for me. Now you love me. Now everything that you think, feel, believe, and promote is going to be centered around me. How do you like that? It doesn't matter. <laughs> and he gave Paul real meaning, a real heart for him, and real love. Now, the reason that God is sovereign over your salvation, Christian, is because he is also sovereign over absolutely everything. So, so far we have seen that God is sovereign in Christ, that God is sovereign over your salvation, Christian, that you have been made a trophy of his grace, an illustration of his glory. But now we're going to see that God is sovereign over everything. Look with me again at our theme verse, verse 11. In him, you also, after listening to the word, oh wait, that is not the right verse. Verse 11, in him we also have been made an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. How many things does God do according to the counsel of his will? All of them. But what about the, uh, all of them? <laughs> 
But certainly God didn't want this bad thing to happen. All of them. There's not one thing that God has not done according to the counsel of his own will. Now, of course, we can believe, and we do believe, because it's the orthodox position that God is not the author of sin. But I want to tell you today that the reason that sin exists in this world and the reason that you are confronted by sin and sin indwells in you is because God ordained it to be such. The reason that we suffer is because God willingly... Romans chapter 1 says that creation itself was subjected to futility because of him the reason that bad things happen in this world he ordained the good in this world he ordained everything passes from his hand he uses all things to magnify Christ and to bring you closer in relationship with him and to put forth his glory Isaiah 46 Verses 9 through 11 says this, Remember the former things long past. God says, For I am God, and there is no other. One of the things I want you to take notice of as I read through some of these scriptures is that God is oftentimes responding in ways to his people that would indicate that they don't understand God like they should be understanding God. And many of us, when we go through things or when we try to chart out our life and how we think it should go, have a really bad understanding of who God is. And we need reminded. And so in Isaiah, he continues on and says, I am God and there is no one like me. In other words, I am absolutely and utterly unique. I declare the end from the beginning, says the Lord. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my counsel will be established. Not that it can, but that it will be established and will accomplish all my good pleasure. So not only will he declare and say that his counsel will stand and be established, but that he will accomplish all that he has declared, said, and established. And it's because of his good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have formed it, surely I will do it. In other words, what is being said in this passage is that God knows the future because he plans the future and accomplishes the future. So in eternity past, when he created all people, he had a plan already that they would fall, that he would save them and redeem them so that his glory could be put on display for the rest of eternity. And what does it mean that God is sovereign over all things? Well, I could spend the next 2,000 hours explaining this to you, and I would love to if you would be so willing to stick around. But because time limits us, let me just say a few things. First, that God is sovereign over all things by being sovereign over nature. There is nothing outside of ourselves that God does not oversee and tend to. Every sunshine and every dawning of the sun and every moon that goes down and every tsunami that hits Florida and every catastrophe that happens, God did that. From his hand it comes. Job 37, 10 through 13 says, From the breath of God ice is made, and the expanse of the waters is frozen. Also with moisture he loads the thick cloud. He scatters the cloud of his lightning. It changes direction, turn, changes direction, turning around by his guidance, that it may do whatever he commands it. On the face of the inhabited earth, whether for correction or for his world or for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. God also says elsewhere that I cause joy and I cause calamity. Everything comes from God. Psalm 147, verse 15, 18 echoes the same realities that we've been talking about when it says, The one, that is God, who sends forth his command to the earth, his word runs very swiftly. The one who gives snow like wool, he scatters the frost like ashes, who casts forth his ice as fragments, who stand before his cold. He sends forth his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow, and so the waters flow. 
Not only is God sovereign over nature, he is also sovereign over the affairs of men. This is why when we see our democracy crumbling at its very core, that we not lose heart. Because God places every person in power that is in power, some for good and some for judgment. And both are glorious revealings of God's omnipotent sovereignty. For instance, Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he pleases. In other words, Joe Biden is a puppet in the hands of God. Everyone is doing God's bidding, whether they are rebellious against him or not. That is how power and how sovereign your God is. That those who rebel against him and actively spend their life working against him are really doing the bidding of his will. Let that cause you to praise him and to stand in awe of him. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every judgment is from Yahweh. The way that we can think about this since we are in Oklahoma is every time a dice is thrown at the casino, God did that. Whatever number is on that dice, God has made it thus. There is no such thing as luck, only God's sovereignly orchestrated providence. That's it. God is sovereign over all things. Thirdly, that means that God is sovereign over our suffering. He is sovereign over our joys, over our pleasures, over our giftedness, and we have spent the last half a year-ish. That's not true. We just planted this church like three months ago. But it seems that long because <laughs> we go verse by verse by verse by verse. But I love that. But he also is sovereign over our suffering. He gives us blessing and he gives us wounds. He creates disasters, disease, disability, and death. He is behind all of these things. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God must entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing good. Do you see that part there that I want to underline? Those who suffer according to the will of God. Your suffering, Christian, if you are engaged in it, is according to the will of God. Who is good, gracious, compassionate, and loving, and has promised good for you? Which is why it can say here, following that statement in 1 Peter 4, that we must entrust our souls to him who is faithful. 1 Peter 3, 17, For it is better, if God should will it, if God should will it, so that you suffer for doing good rather than for doing wrong. So not only is tragedy that comes upon us in whatever that form may be sovereignly orchestrated by God, but the sin that comes against us by even so-called believers who would pervert God's grace and wound us because of their sinful pride and arrogance. And then, of course, underneath the suffering is that God is also sovereign over disease. And I understand that this is a hard one to wrap our minds fully around, especially if we are thrown in the thrust of contacting, getting, receiving cancer, having a diagnosis, a family member, a child that is not good, that is heartbreakingly tragic and life-altering, for miscarriages, for all of these things. It says in Exodus 4, chapter 11, And Yahweh said to him, Who has made man's mouth? 
or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? Is it not I, Yahweh? Is it not me who causes all of these things to happen? That we would see this and believe it. Not mock it. But see God. For who he is. And you have to see that God is responsible for this. Because if God is not responsible. If he's not the one who causes these things to happen. Then you have no reason to hope in him. Because then things are out of his control. He's unable to come to the aid of those who need him. But because he is God. And because he is sovereign, and because he is loving, he can use that tragedy that he has ordained to bring about more good than if it never existed in the first place. And how does that work, Pastor? I don't know. But we can entrust our hearts, our lives, our worries, our anxieties in the face of suffering because we know that we have a God who is, suffer or who is sovereign and good even to us in our suffering. God turns every bit of suffering for good for the Christian. We've talked about this already in Romans chapter 8. But we can also see it in the story of Joseph, for example. We can see it in the book of Job. But let's look at the story of Joseph for just a few seconds here. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis he had some brothers growing up who didn't like him because he kept having dreams and he had dreams that they would fall down and worship him. And um, I mean, who wouldn't like that guy? Let's be honest, right? If you had some guy coming around all the time being like, you know, I had his dream last night. You were going to worship me. Sorry. And they just always were really jealous of him because he seemed to be the favorite child in some respect. And so they decided that they were going to kill him. They were going to meet him out in the wilderness and they were going to slaughter him. That way they didn't have to deal with him anymore. Through a turn of events, they decided that killing them might be going a little too far. So they threw him, a pit, threw him in a pit to die, kind of decide what they were going to do. And then they saw a caravan coming that was needing to buy some slaves for Egypt. And so they sold him to Egypt and then they dipped his tunic into blood, took it back to their father and said, a lion or a bear or something got him. We don't know. We just found this. And everybody wept. The father cried in sackcloth and ashes. And he goes to Egypt and he suffers under the affliction of Egypt. He was blessed as well. But Joseph never really saw it as a blessing. And I would love to get into that, but we do not have time. But here's the reality. Those men did evil to Joseph. And he suffered greatly. But in Genesis chapter 45, verse 8, Joseph is reacquainted with his brothers. And he says to them, it was not you who sent me here to Egypt, but God. And he has sent me as a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. And in Genesis 50, 20, he speaks to them again and says, As for you, you meant evil against me. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to do what has happened on this day to keep many people alive. There's always a purpose for your suffering Christian, because God is sovereign. And this is not even come close to the illustration given to us in the cross of Jesus Christ. There is nothing that has happened that is more evil than the slaughtering of the Son of God. And there is nothing more vile than he had to go to the sin for our sin, because of our evil. He was killed by evil men because of evil men for the sake of evil men. And it was all their fault, but it wasn't. 
It wasn't. In Acts 2.23, Peter is preaching a sermon and he's trying to help the people who are in his way understand that God just accomplished a really big thing. He just accomplished the salvation of many peoples. A new covenant is here by virtue of the blood of the Son of Jesus Christ. And he said, this man, Jesus Christ, delivered over by the predetermined plan, the sovereign plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him to death. By the predetermined plan of God, by His sovereign orchestration, you slaughtered the Son of God. You made Him suffer. But God says, I did that. I did that for you. The believer's life is one because of God's sovereignty that points to and has a direction toward God. Children, would you look at me? Did you know that if you love Jesus and you live your life for him, that nothing bad is going to be the end of your story? That there will always be good that comes out of it, even if it's only when we see Jesus and then it all will make sense. Fourthly, God's sovereignty then, then, if we understand this, if we can wrap our mind around this reality, produces God worshipers. See, the lie of people who do not take God's sovereignty seriously is that if for some reason we see God behind everything, if we see his hands and his fingertips involved in absolute everything, then we would see him as a monster and not good. But that is not the witness of the Bible, and that is not the truth. The truth is that God being sovereign is the most beautiful, most helpful reality in all of the world. And it's because of sovereignty that we can have hope in salvation, we can have help in trouble, and we can actually see salvation and our inheritance and glory to come as being made possible because he cannot fail. He cannot err. It says here at the end, in verse 11, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, to the end, there's a goal, there's an end to this thing that we have first hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. This is more repetition of the reality that you have made trophies of his grace. Because he is sovereign, because he has done all of these things and predestined us and made his inheritance, God can rightly be praised. He can rightly be seen as God. He, he can rightly be seen as the one who orchestrates like a beautiful symphony of moving pieces that you can't see that make a beautiful song. Let me tell you, if you hear a tuba by itself, it's not all that impressive. But in a symphony orchestra, when it's complimenting that which is made to compliment, there's nothing more beautiful. There are things in your life, Christian, that may not make sense. There are things in your life that may just sound horrid, that may be horrid. But when you look from the perspective of eternity, it's going to be the most beautiful song you have seen purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ because of the sovereignty of God the Father and the application of the Holy Spirit. So in closing, I want to just leave you with seven short uses that we can put in our pocket and take with us home. The first one is, in light of this text, stand in awe of God's divine sovereignty. Don't let it move your heart to saying, that's not so. Or that would mean that somehow I'm not respond. No, stand in awe. You're not supposed to fully understand it. You're supposed to be undone by it. Secondarily, praise God for the salvation that he has both orchestrated and wrought in us by the work of his sovereignty. Most of you, if you look back upon how Christ wooed you and won him to yourself, would say, if it wasn't for God doing it, there's no way that would have happened. Me, I had to go to the desert in the middle of Djibouti, Africa, surrounded by war-torn communities 
to see my depravity. And to see the goodness and graciousness and holiness of God and the work that he had done on behalf of me and his son, Jesus Christ. Thirdly, and maybe most importantly, quite honestly, in light of this text, reject God belittling man-centeredness and embrace a big God theology. Oh, these truths are so great, too great for me to sink my teeth into. And really, we want to think about what man has to do in all of No, no. Paul wants you to forget about yourself in the book of Ephesians until we get to that practical outworking in the second half of the book, verses 4 through 6. Right now, he's trying to plant your feet firmly in the reality that God is God and you are not. And so any theology that would make light of God's godness and bigness, you reject it full out. You don't tamper with it. You don't... God is big, and we are not. And sovereignty reminds us of that reality. Fourthly, in light of God's sovereignty, pray confidently. Pray confidently. The sin that you're struggling with, the health problems that you have, the sick children that you might have, understand that your prayer is efficacious. That it does something because God can actually do something. Since God is not sitting by and just happens to know that some things will come to pass, since he causes all things to come to pass, you can trust him with your prayers, with your pleadings, and with your life and your children's life and your children's death. You can trust him and you can pray to him confidently. Fifthly, rejoice that your evangelism evangelism efforts cannot fail in light of God's sovereignty. Many of us are too afraid to go out and do evangelism. Many of us are too afraid to go and tell our neighbors about Jesus because we're afraid they'll reject Jesus or I won't be able to say the right things. Look, if I thought the only way that I could preach is that if I preach better than all my preaching heroes, I would never get in this pulpit. But here's what I trust. I trust that God will use my efforts because it's not about me. And it's not about you, which means you can tell your coworkers, your friends, your family, and your neighbors and your the strangers at the ball games and the abortion clinics about Jesus because he's sovereign. He's sovereign. It doesn't matter how much you stutter. It doesn't matter how much theology uh, that you still need to learn. It doesn't matter. Rejoice that in God's sovereignty, he will achieve his purposes. And sometimes his purpose is that they won't listen. That they would receive judgment for rejecting the Son of God so that he could exercise in his sovereignty his wrath against them. But sometimes he will bridge the gap of your inept ability to speak, your lack of Bible knowledge, and he will show off because God delights to flex and use the foolish things in the world to shame the wise. That's why I preach. (laughs) I preach because I can trust that God will use a fool to do his work. Because when he uses fools, he gets more glory. Sixth, be sober-minded about your afflictions in light of God's sovereignty. Be sober-minded about your afflictions in light of God's sovereignty. Here's what this message is not supposed to produce in the Christian heart. Hey, don't worry about it. It's okay. There's something better coming for you. No. No. That's not what I'm saying here. Sometimes bad things happen to Christians, and sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it stings, and sometimes it's hard to get out of bed in the morning because affliction is very real and very present. And you can't just swallow a pill of good news and just, it's all better. So feel it. But take that feeling and give it to Jesus. Walk with your community here at Heritage. 
and understand that it is heartbreaking. And you need to understand it is heartbreaking because when Jesus undoes the hell that has been unleashed upon this world because of sin and triumphs, triumphs over it in Christ Jesus, that we can stand in more awe and more love of him. Feel the pain and know that it will go away someday. He'll be the one to wipe the tears from your eyes. And seven, and lastly, worship God because he uses his sovereign power for good. If God was all powerful and all sovereign, he still, owe, he still is owed worship because we are not. He is still God. But our God, who is in the heavens and does all that he pleases, is good. He is compassionate and he is loving. And every bit of power that he exercises in and through his sovereign plan to redeem his people and to make a home for them forevermore in his presence has done so with love in his heart. And all of his affection that he has pointed at you in his power is good. Even if it doesn't feel like it. So God has, according to the counsel of his own will, sovereignly orchestrated all things that come to pass for the praise of his glory and the saints' good. God is sovereign in Christ. God is sovereign over your salvation, Christian. And God is sovereign over all things. And God's sovereignty produces God worshipers. Believe that. Father, help us to see your sovereignty in the beauty and glory that it is. Help us not to mock it, not to question it, but to stand in awe of it. Help it to embolden us to stand against the tides of our day, against affliction, and against our own anxieties and fears. And help us to remind us that you have made us an inheritance. That you, who began a good work in us, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Not because we merit it, not because we deserve it, but because you are a good God who exercises his sovereignty according to your good pleasure, which is compassionate and loving. Help us to love Christ more deeply and to see you more clearly and to work out our salvation faithfully. We ask this again in Jesus' name. Amen.